Well, good morning, Eastern Hills Church. We are so glad that you're here this morning. If you would just stand as we go into worship. If you got something to praise the Lord about this morning, we want you singing. We want you clapping. Let's praise the Lord this morning. Here we go. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'll praise on the valley. I'll praise on the mountain. Praise when I'm sure. Praise when I'm doubting. I'll praise when I'm numbered. Praise when surrounded.
Our favorite things that we get to do as a body of believers is to celebrate baptism. And so we get the chance today to join with Samantha Sutzik in declaring her testimony, sharing her testimony of faith, and then getting the chance to, to baptize her today. And so uh, as we always do here, baptism is a huge deal. And so um, as she comes up out of the water, I just encourage you, we want to make sure that, you know, the Bible says that heaven celebrates when this happens, when somebody declares their faith. And so I just want to make sure that we as a congregation are ready to do that. I, I think we should actually practice. Should we do that? All right. So imagine I bring her up out of the water. What's it going to sound like? Awesome. Well, before we get to that point, let's just hear a testimony from Samantha. Relating to most testimonies I hear, I was also raised to believe that religion was the key to salvation. I never felt like I belonged in a Catholic church because I would always sit in my thoughts and not pay attention. After I made my confirmation, I stopped going to church unless it was a holiday because I felt ashamed if I didn't go, even though I didn't consider myself a religious person anymore. I still believed in God, but that was it. I always thought of myself as a good person who followed good morals but I was certainly not living a holy lifestyle. I was lustful, a spendthrift, and I cussed a lot. Then anxiety entered my life after I got engaged and worsened when I got pregnant with my son. I tried multiple anti-anxiety meds that never seemed to work. I always wished to feel normal again. My mom and my sister were stronger in their faith and they were always nagging me to read my Bible and pray, but I never wanted to listen. My mom has a bolder approach to preaching about Jesus, which God bless your soul, because Jesus tells us to be bold. But my sister has a calmer approach. And through many conversations about God, I slowly started to understand and seek him. I started coming to Eastern Hills and really enjoyed what Pastor Pat and Pastor Justin spoke about each week because it always felt relatable. I started reading my, the Bible, which sparked a revelation. One day I went to reach for my anxiety meds and something inside told me not to, to stop taking them. It was that moment that I became fully dependent on God to give me peace. It's been six months since I've stopped taking medication, and I thank God every day for giving me that peace I was searching for. I realize now that he has been there all along, blessing me with a husband and a baby that I prayed for since I can remember. I also now realize that a relationship with Jesus is the key to not only salvation, but to a peaceful life. Samantha, just two quick questions. Have you truly committed your life to Jesus Christ? Yes. 
And do you intend to follow him the rest of the days of your life? I do. Based on that profession of faith, I baptize you, Samantha Marie Sudzik, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The reign of darkness now has ended in the kingdom of
from our eyes and everything will be made right but until then we know who still reigns on the throne and it is you and you alone so God we lay down our lives for you because you are the very one who gave us life you reign above all things whatever we are facing in our life right now we can have confidence and assurance that you reign over it that you are sovereign and that you care so deeply. You love your mercy and your grace for us is more than we could ever comprehend. So thank you, Lord. Jesus, we come with open hearts today. We wanna to hear from you. And might you receive all praise and glory. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Be seated. Good morning, Eastern Hills. It is such a pleasure to be here. Like Miss Donna said, she was once my teacher. Um, I am Stephanie Couch, and I did grow up at this church from five all the way through college. I know down here under this carpet, I have written some names of friends that I was hoping that will come to know Jesus back in the day. Um, in 2010, I was called to serve overseas as a missionary in Auckland, New Zealand. Now, when you think of New Zealand, you might not automatically think of an intercultural mission field. You might, in fact, think of Lord of the Rings, yeah? Mm -hmm. But not only is our landscape stunning, but as you've seen in that video, we have a beautiful and diverse range of ethnicities and cultures within our Wesleyan Church movement. Now, the Wesleyan Church, much like we're experiencing here, I'm sure, as well, is in the middle of a discipleship crisis. For example, my friend Meleketi is a Tongan young woman raised in New Zealand, born in Tonga. Her family and her church is Tongan language speaking. She is English speaking mostly. So when she has attended church her whole life, she doesn't really have a good grasp of the language and is missing the truth in the heart of Jesus because she doesn't understand. And her story is so typical. For many young immigrant children, as soon as they are able to, they leave the church and whatever faith of their parents of their culture, they leave behind. But for Mele Katie, praise God, through connection and coaching, her faith has come alive. It's no longer just her parents' religion, but now a relationship with a living God, and she's serving and sacrificially in her church, working with the young ones. Amen, that's right, thank you. Yes, exactly. I was just texting with her behind stage. I was like, girl, I'm gonna talk about you. <laughs> um, a devastating reality, though, is in New Zealand, it's actually quite a harsh environment. Um, we have one of the, don't cry, don't cry, we have one of the highest rates of youth suicide in the OECD, <clears throat> particularly amongst the demographic I work closest with. 
I'm working with many young adults who are these beautiful volunteers, working jobs, doing university, raising young families, while devoting a lot of time to the church but have never been properly trained. I want these young people to be equipped for the long haul, and that's exactly what my role is. I do that. I help them to have access to the training that they need. As we know, life is hard. Ministry is hard. Walking in faith with God is hard. And having someone like myself who can come alongside and coach them, and in a language that they understand as well, as they're navigating between their parents' culture, which is important and beautiful, and then the culture that they are living in. Now, in our movement, um, there's not a lot of resource. Surprise, surprise. Most of our churches are small, and the leadership are volunteer or tent makers. So there's not a lot of resource. I think back to my days being here um, as, as a kid in the youth ministry and then growing up and then volunteering and then even working for the church here. And I think of the people who coached me and what an instrumental difference they made to how I understand Jesus and how that has shaped my life. That was life-changing for me, and now this work that I do is life-changing for these youth leaders, and not just them, the young ones that they're working with. I'm training them how to do exactly what has been done to me and imparting that faith. So Eastern Hills, you have supported me as a church for as long as my conscious memory exists. <laughs> For years now, 14 years I've been on the field, you financially supported me as well as a wider church. And today I'm asking for individuals and families to consider supporting me financially as well. At the moment, my role is not fully funded. The shortfall is $17,000. And if you break that down, it's about 15 individuals or families giving $100 a month. And I'd be fully funded. But guys, let's be honest, I'm a missionary. I'll take anything, so thanks for that. <laughs> Every contribution is helpful. If you want to come and say hi to me, please, please, please do. I'll be hanging out in the library after the service for like a meet and greet and hang out. There might even be free food. I don't know if that's a good bait. You can come and grab um, a prayer card. It's a really cute picture of me and my little family on it and a QR code that links you right up to my um, page where you can donate. And I just want to say again, my deepest, deepest gratitude for how this church has supported me in myriad ways over the years, and particularly over these last 14 years that I've been in New Zealand. Thank you. In New Zealand, we would say in Te Reo Māori, the indigenous language um, of New Zealand, we would say Nya Mihi Nui. Thank you so much. Now changing tack, as a Houghton University graduate, I'm excited to say that Dr. Wayne Lewis, the president of Houghton University, will be sharing today. So go ahead and turn your attention to the screens as we carry on in Acts chapter two. Good morning, friends. Good morning. It is so good to see you. We're continuing in the series that we've been in for a couple weeks, Get Your Acts Together, and we are in Acts chapter 2. This morning, I want to read for you a couple verses from Acts chapter 2, um, verses 42 through 47. 42 through 47, and we are going to give special emphasis this morning to verses 44 and 45. And it reads, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. 
Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. For added emphasis, I want to reread again just verses 44 and 45. Verse 44, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to gather, this opportunity to give you glory to find fellowship with believers, to encourage one another. And now as we've arrived at this moment, Father, we pray that you would speak unmistakably to our hearts, that you would allow us to hear what you have to say to us collectively and individually. Speak through me, Lord God, for your your words have power. Your words give healing. Your, Your words give life. And we'll be careful to give you all praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, I, like many young people, found myself in college um, trying to figure out um, where God was leading me, how the gifts God had given me aligned with his purpose for my life. I wasn't exactly sure. I ended up changing my major a couple times. What I did have pretty early in my college career, though, was this nearly overwhelming sense that God was calling me to a life of service. I didn't know exactly where. I didn't know exactly what he was leading me to, but I I felt very clearly that I I was called to serve. And so the first place I tested and and tried to see if this was the place God was calling me to uh, was actually in law enforcement. I joined the sheriff's office um, pretty early in in my college career. I ended up changing my major eventually um, to criminal justice. Um, And it made sense to me that that's where I, I would try. I think for most young people and not so young people, as you're thinking about what you might do, how you might serve, how you might contribute. Your personal lived context factors pretty mightily in that. And I was a native of the city of New Orleans. I'd grown up in a community uh, where crime, unfortunately, was was a major part um, of of our lives. And I, I recognized the role that police officers often had to play in our community in keeping us safe. And I, I reasoned, I thought that, that maybe God was leading me and calling me to the place where I could serve in that respect. My mother, a little bit later um, down the road, encouraged me, however, to consider education. She was the first person to ever Um, say to me that she thought I would be a good teacher. At this point in my career, I've been in higher education for um, now 18 years. I've been serving as as Houghton's president for three years, started year four um, this summer, and I've spent the majority of my career in higher education, but that's not where I started in education. I started as a, a teacher in middle school and high school, and it was out of this Um, desire to serve and leading of my mother um, to consider a career that I believe was much less dangerous than law enforcement. And so I did find myself beginning a career in the New Orleans public schools, first at Booker T. Washington High School um, as a teacher, Um, and and it was was an experience for me. I think I, I went into education in some ways Um, in hindsight and on reflection with a little bit of a savior complex um, in thinking, well, these kids, they they clearly have challenges and there are things that they need and there are problems in our education system, but what they really need is an amazing teacher like me. They really need somebody who can come in and and really gets them and is going to work hard and um, and I can make the difference in these kids' lives. And, and those of you, I have some teachers. Any teachers in the room? 
I think teachers will testify for you that the impact that teachers can make on the lives, the individual lives of young people is incredible. In fact, I've not done anything since I was a classroom teacher where I've been able to have that degree of impact on the individual lives of, of kids and families. What I did run into, however, as a teacher in the New Orleans public schools was the recognition that the challenges of the system and the societal challenges that we face around making sure that um, young people, particularly who came from a, a low income, high poverty, high crime environment, got a great education, that those challenges were a lot bigger than me. First of all, they had me as their teacher which truth, truth be told was a part of the challenge. I was, I was serving at Booker T. Washington High School, which at that time was the lowest performing school in the city of New Orleans, which was the lowest performing district in, in the state of Louisiana, which the state of Louisiana was one of the lowest performing states in the country. These kids had major challenges, and I had had a full two months of training in education and was going to pursue my teaching certification. For kids who really needed an amazing teacher, I was not it. But I'm who they got. That's a systemic failure, if we're honest, if we're honest about it. Not only that, but the, the challenges that they had faced prior to getting to school, that they faced all around school, all the other stuff that they were dealing with in the community um, where we served and where they lived, those were barriers that most kids, if you live in middle class communities or affluent communities, you just don't have to deal with. There was a systemic challenge, and that led me to want to have a role and have a voice and do some work on the policy side. To want to have greater impact on the system so that kids showing up in school, even if they had a great teacher, which was not me, but even if they had a great teacher, that the deck was not stacked against them. And so I got into higher education and, and studied and wrote and taught primarily in the area of education policy and school community engagement. And I ran upon pretty early in my academic career um, this, this theory, this notion of collective impact. It really took hold of me. Collective impact is this idea that was coined by two guys, John Carney and Mark Kramer, in a 2011 article in the Stanford Social Science, Social Innovation Review, um, where they, they reasoned that in order to tackle the big, complex, systemic, societal challenges that we need to, to tackle, like generational um, poverty, like the persistent challenges of of getting people from low kids from low income communities educated and on to productive careers and into, into college. Those types of big challenges that if we were really gonna make meaningful progress in those areas that we had to do it collectively. That individual organizations, individual entities, whether it's schools or churches or nonprofits, doing this work on their own could only do so much. That they needed to be networked as a part of a community. Not only that, but they all needed to be working toward a common purpose and on a common agenda. A networked community of entities or organizations all working toward a common purpose and on a common agenda. They reasoned that that's the only way we could really, as communities, as society, as a society, make impact on these big intractable problems. That caught hold of me, and that type of thinking is what really framed the next portion of my career as, as I move forward with research and writing and eventually in the government and policy. But, but truth be told, I didn't recognize it at the time, but the principles undergirding this collective impact idea from, Car from Carnia and, and, um, and Kramer are biblical principles. And in truth, this collective impact notion is illustrated pretty well by the early church that we just read about in Acts chapter 2. 
We've been in this series for a couple weeks now. We've, we've talked about the Holy Spirit um, visiting um, the apostles in the upper room and the coming of the, the Holy Spirit, the empowering of the Holy Spirit, baptism of the Holy Spirit, pre Peter's preaching and conviction, um, and now their behavior as an early church, what this first church looked like. And they did this church, if there's any one word that stands out to me in terms of how they behaved and how they went about their work, it is collectively. They did it together. And so I think there are some things that just these two verses that we raised for emphasis this morning are trying to teach us about the collective impact or the potential collective impact of the church even in 2024. And I want to raise three of those things for your consideration this morning. What is it that verses 44 and 45 are speaking to our hearts and to our circumstances, even at Eastern Hills in 2024? Well, the first thing is I think it's trying to express the importance of Christians having a willingness and a desire to do Christian life together to do it together, to do it collectively. And that runs against what we see sometimes culturally in segments of the Christian church, particularly in segments of the Christian church in the United States where we tend to operate in a much more individualistic, almost transactional type manner with the church. In too many pockets of the American church, I think it's the case that, that we say and we sing about the church being the body of Christ, but in our practice, the church does in fact end up becoming a place or an organization that we interact with in most cases one or two or three times a month. And we're interacting with it on a Sunday morning where we're coming in, we're hearing the preached word of God, we're, we're hearing and participating in worship, and then we depart to go about our individual lives until it's time to have interaction with the church again. That's not, however, based on biblical principles. In fact, it's probably more based on um, cultural ideas that are not always anti-Christian. But I do think it's important that we recognize when our behavior, when the way we carry out things, particularly in the church, are not informed by biblical principles. Because the Word of God would lead us to believe and help us to understand that the church the body of Christ was never intended to be done in a transactional manner, that this Christianity thing was never intended to be done individually. It was always intended to be done collectively as a body, as a group. But doing church, doing Christian life together gets much messier than the place I think a lot of us would be really comfortable yet, if we're honest about it. Because it goes much further than just the transactional type relationship that we would have on Sunday mornings. Doing church, doing Christian life together means things get messy. It means people start to be able to see what my living looks like aside from just what I present a couple mornings on Sunday means you, you start to, to be able to see how I really talk to my kids, right? It's one thing when, when, when Johnny is, is, is running a little bit faster than he needs to um, coming down the hallway in, in, in the church on the sanctuary and one or two hours on Sunday morning, and we can smile and say, oh, Johnny, slow down. When we know... And in most instances, when Johnny has not followed our first, second, and third direction, that the tone in our voice changes a little bit. <laughs> 
Doing church together means being able to see each other and support each other and hold each other accountable and encourage each other and pray for each other. It's so much more than what so many of us of American Christians have experienced. Not only that, but I think the verses are trying to teach us that along with, 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 with doing Christian life together comes this willingness and desire to behave and act selflessly. With selfless behavior being the opposite of selfish Behavior. Selfish meaning very simply behaving in my own interests. That being the church, being the body of Christ that we're called to be means taking on the burdens, the challenges, the disappointments, but also the joys and the celebrations and the triumphs of our brothers and sisters in Christ. That yes, as our brothers and sisters in Christ come to the church, as they join our body of believers, that we rejoice in their decision to make Jesus Lord of their lives. And we support and encourage that decision. We walk alongside them in discipleship, but we also recognize, as shown to us in verses 44 and 45, that people come sometimes with real needs as well. Sometimes those needs are physical. Sometimes people come with hunger. And yes, we need to support and nurture and disciple them, but friends, we also need to feed them. Sometimes people come with with needs that that, that mean they, they need clothing, they need shelter. Sometimes people come with addiction. Sometimes people come with, with joblessness, with homelessness. And, and, and the, what it's teaching us, what this is teaching us is those needs are not needs that we say, well, you come here to the church for your spiritual health and development, but, but those other things, you should go talk to social services means that as people join the body of Christ, join Eastern Hills Church, that we are willing to walk alongside them. If need be, taking them by the hand to connect them with resources, to connect them with other people, with other organizations, with other entities, with with which we have relationships, because those needs they come with are real. And if those needs are not addressed, those needs become the footholds that Satan uses to continue to worm his way into their lives and into their families and destroy their relationships with Jesus. The church is not called to do that in addition to bringing people and introducing people to Jesus. That's a part of who we are to be. That's who we are. So a willingness and a desire to do Christian life together, a willingness and a desire to walk alongside people and bear burdens and and share celebrations and triumphs. And the third thing I think we should learn from verses 44 and 45 is just the, the power the collective power of the body of Christ when unified. I do have the privilege now of of serving at Houghton University and and our students, I know I'm biased as president, but I think our students are the best. Um, They really are, in all sincerity, they are incredible young people. And I count it as a privilege to be a part of what God is doing in their lives, to walk alongside them usually for a couple years as they are discerning God's call and God is leading them and positioning them to have impact on the kingdom, transformational impact um, on the kingdom. There are two things that, that I pray for with our students and we work toward. One, they come to us in different 
places in their spiritual lives and spiritual walks. The vast majority of young people who come to Houghton University are Christians. We are not um, and had never been an institution that only serves Christians. And so we do have a smaller portion of students who come to Houghton for, for different reasons um, who are not Christian. But for students who come who are Christian, one of the most transformational things I get to see and witness with students is students who have gone to church their whole lives and been part of Christian families, gone to to camps and and had all the the traditional, the cultural Christian experiences, but uh, who've come to the place at age 18, 19, 20, where they recognize that they've never personally made the decision to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And we get to see for so many of those young people come to the place where they personally decide to pull their boat ashore and follow Jesus. That's an incredible thing. I want for every young person at Houghton University, um, whether they come as a Christian or not, for them to understand the power of having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So understand that Jesus wants to know them intimately, them individually, and that they can have such an individual relationship with Jesus that he walks with them and speaks to their hearts and their minds and and their context, not only now, but will for the rest of their lives. That individual relationship with Jesus is a critical part of the discipleship that I hope we're providing for young people. But the second part of my prayer for young people is as they discern where and how God is calling them as they leave Houghton University, that they understand that they're being called with unique gifts and talents and abilities to specific places in specific seasons, but that they're not going out to be Lone Ranger Christians. That the calling God has placed on his church is in fact a calling for us to preach and teach the gospel and make disciples of Jesus Christ from here to the ends of the earth. But he's called us to do that as the body of Christ. And that the collective impact that we can have as a church, as a, as a networked body of believers working toward a shared purpose on a common agenda is so much greater than anything we could possibly accomplish individually. Not only that, but that's what God has called us to be. We are the branches that need to be plugged into the vine. We are the body of Christ. Much like humanity bears the the image of our creator as the body of Christ, we are collectively the body of Jesus Christ. Pick your favorite body part, and as much as you love that body part, you disconnect it from the rest of the body, and I bet it's not as much fun. I bet it's not nearly as functional. The body of Christ is the same way. And so as the worship team prepares to to come out, I want to just leave you with this. And this is my prayer for us as we close this morning. My prayer for us is that God would continue to break our hearts for the body of Christ. Meaning God would continue to break our hearts for each other. Recognizing that my brothers and sisters, not just in the big body, but even if we are to think right here at Eastern Hills, that we're sitting in pews and walking alongside brothers and sisters who come often with smiles on their faces 
and sometimes with great joys and great excitement about the things that God is doing in their lives and the things that God is doing with them, but that we're walking alongside brothers and sisters who come with needs and challenges and that they need you. Not only that, but I know you need them. That you might not be one of the brothers or sisters who walks in the church who needs um, the church to help you with rent this month. You might not be a brother or sister who walks into the church and needs um, some help with, with child care assistance so that you can get to work or some help with getting your car fixed. Maybe that's not your need. Maybe God has blessed you in such a way that those things have been taken care of, taken care of, but you may very well be the brother, the sister who walks into these doors every week who desperately needs the encouragement of the body. Because you're facing a challenge, an obstacle, something that's in your way, that's in your path that you just can't see on the other side of. You might very well be the brother, the sister who walks in the doors every week with an illness that no one else knows about. But you bury it deep in your heart and you're dreading every appointment. You're dreading every test. You're trying to think through how you're going to get through this, this health challenge, this health scare. And what you really need is a community of believers, of people who love Jesus, who can surround you not only with comfort and prayer, but who can encourage your heart and remind you of the power of Almighty God working in and through us. You might be a brother or a sister who, 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 who comes here every week who's having challenges in your home, whether it's with your marriage or with your children. You may have a child who's walking in such a way that he or she just can't or won't hear you. And you're saying all the right things and doing all the right things and modeling what it means to be a Christian, but you need someone else who loves Jesus to speak a word into their hearts and into their lives that they can hear. I mean really hear that might have transformational impact on their living. Friends, don't kid yourselves. I don't care if you walk in this door and never need a dime from anybody. We need each other. And my prayer for us is that God would continue to break our hearts for each other, that we could join together in those, those moments of need, those moments of disappointment, those more moments of heartache, but that we can also celebrate together in those moments of triumph, those moments of pure joy. Oh, what a privilege it is to walk alongside our brothers and sisters as they walk this Christian journey. Please pray with me. Lord God, I thank you for the body of Christ. I thank you for the calling that you have placed on us, Lord, not just individually, but collectively pray that you would continue to make that collective calling clearer and clearer to our hearts and our minds with each passing day. And Father, I, I pray as well that you would continue to allow us to see the needs of our brothers and sisters. Not only to see them, Lord, but that, that we would willingly take on the burdens and the challenges and the needs of our brothers and sisters, that we would walk with them, Lord, in tears, that we would walk with them in laughter, and that you would allow us the blessed privilege, Lord, of, of reflecting your love to them, our brothers and sisters. Strengthen us, Lord God. Keep us Lord God, for the journey and the calling you've placed before us. 
We give you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Nothing is a sacrifice. Oh, use me how you want to, God. Have your throne within my heart. I hear you call. I 